Hey guys, in this video we're going to talk about M.2.1 through M.2.3. So the first thing we're going to talk about is extracting information from tables, charts, and graphs. So let's just get into it with an example. So here we have a graph, a line graph in particular, and this graph is modeling Monique's water intake on Saturday. And we can see on the y-axis that this axis represents tens of fluid ounces. And on the x-axis, or the horizontal axis, we have time throughout the day. So the first question is, can you find the point when Monique drank 100 ounces of water? Well, since our y-axis is in tens of fluid ounces, we know that each of these numbers we should multiply by 10 to get the correct number of ounces. So 10 times 10, this guy is going to represent 100 ounces. This guy is going to represent 120 ounces and so forth. So what time in the day does she consume 100 ounces of water? Well, we just have to um, look at where the height is 10 so and see where it intersects the graph so if we we just go out like this to see where the height intersects the graph that's going to be this point right here and the question is what time does this height occur and for that we need to look at where it is on the x-axis and it's out here at 4 p.m. so that is going to give us our answer of 4 p.m. And then at what time did Monique drink 120 ounces of water? Well, again, 120 is approximately right here. That's the height. And so then we just see what the corresponding time is, and that's at 6 p.m. Next question is, what would you predict Monique's water intake to be by 8 p.m.? Well, we want to look at the amount of change that's happening. And it looks like our x-axis goes up in increments of 2. We have 8 to 10, 10 to noon, noon to 12, etc. So let me just get rid of some of this. So we can figure out what the, the trend is. So um, it looks like, you know, from here, from 8 to 10, well, this looks like we're increasing by about, uh, 20 ounces right because at 8 a.m. we have 20 ounces and at 10 p.m. we have 40 ounces so the change from 20 to 40 is 20 same thing here from 4 to 6 so you know after two hours have passed that looks like again to be a change of 20 ounces um, and so, yeah, from 10 to noon, so we're at 40, and then we go to s about 60. That's, again, a change of 20 ounces. From noon to 2 is, again, about a change of 20 ounces. So it looks like, it looks like, looks like we're adding 20 ounces for every two hours. So it says, what would you predict the water intake to be by 8 p.m.? Well, here at 6, we're at 120 ounces, and 8 p.m. is two hours away, so we expect that we'll have about 120 plus 20, which is 140 ounces. So that's one example of how we can use a graph to um, to analyze uh, data that's changing over time. Let's look at another one. So this is a multiple choice question. It says, which of the following observations based on the graph is correct? So let's go through each of these choices and determine whether or not it makes sense based on our graph here. First of all, number or letter A says the cost of maintaining a car is constantly increasing each year. 
Well, that's not true. Because if we look at the x-axis, that's years. So from year three to year four, yes, it's increasing. That's definitely true. From year four to year five, yes, that's increasing. That's true. But look, from year one to year two, the cost remains the same. The cost at year one is 200, and the cost at year two is also 200. So that is going to be a false statement there. Let's look at choice B. For the first three years, it costs $400 to maintain the car. Well, if we look at year one, so year one has a height of 200, so that's going to be $200 to repair the car. Year two is again, again, at year two, we have a height of 200. Year three, at year three, we have a height of 400. So all together, all together we have a total cost of 800, which is not 400. So B can also not be the correct answer. Okay, let's look at the next one. So it says, the average rate of change between year one and year four is $150 per year. So average rate of change just means slope. And remember, our slope formula is y2 minus y1, all divided by x2 minus x1. So let's figure out what our points are for year one and year four. So year one, since the number of years is on the x-axis, one is going to be our first x value. We'll call it x1. And then what's the height associated with it? Well, the height associated with year one is 200. So that's our y1. And you could have picked the other point with 4 as x1, y1, but I'm just using this one. So the next one is year 4, so our second x value is 4, and the corresponding y value to 4, well here's 4, so the corresponding height is 800. So that's y2. So if we plug in these values into our slope formula, we get m equals y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1, which is going to give us 600 divided by 4. Which is going to simplify to, let's see. Um, Oh, I'm sorry, this is not 600 divided by 4, this is 600 divided by 3. I apologize. So when we simplify, that's going to give us 200 and our units, we have dollars per year. Okay, so choice C is not correct, however, choice D is the one we want because this is telling us that our rate of change is $200 per year as shown right here. All right, let's look at a bar graph. So again, another little practice multiple choice question. Which of the following based on the graph is true? So let's look at choice A. It says, well, okay, so we have, it might be a little bit hard to see, but the darkest of colors is day three, the medium shade gray is day two, and the lightest shade is day one. So it says day three yielded the most zucchini. So if we look at zucchini, well, actually, no, day three is the darkest, so it looks like day one yielded the most zucchini since it's the highest up, 40 pounds sold versus around 35 pounds sold. So that's not a true statement. Let's look at choice B. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, it says the number of pounds of corn sold each from days one to three increased each day. Now let's look at corn. So day one is about 55. Day two is about 65. And day three is a little bit higher than that, maybe 68 or so. So this is true. This is definitely true. 
it it has increased from day one to day three each each day we can see the height is increasing a little bit and let's prove that the other ones are false um, so choice C about 10 pounds of squash was sold over the three days well if I look at this it looks like there's definitely more than 10 pounds added up I see about 30 pounds for day one about 35 pounds for day two and day three so 30 plus 70 is about 100 pounds, not 10 pounds. All right, so that's false. And finally, choice D, the most carrots were sold on day three. Well, if we look at carrots, the highest bar corresponds to the most number of pounds sold. And we can see in this case, that's day one. So that one is false as well. And our answer choice here is B. Okay, so use the table, or sorry, use the bar graph to fill in the table. So here we have our darker shade is Frank, Frank's tips, and our lighter shade is Danny's tips. And the different bars are telling you how much each of these people earned on each day of the week in tips. So on Monday, Danny's tips, if we look at Monday, Danny's tips are in the lighter shade, and it looks like these guys go up by 5, right? 10, 15, 20. So uh, Danny's going to earn 15 bucks on Monday. While Frank, if we look where Frank's bar intersects the y-axis, Frank's going to earn 20 bucks. Okay, so that's how we read these. I, I do encourage you to pause the video and see if you can fill in the rest of this table. I think we have the idea down. We're just looking at the corresponding height for each bar. Okay. Okay, now that we have that filled out, let's go ahead and answer some of these questions down here. It says, on what night did Danny's daily tips decrease from the previous night? Well, from Monday to Tuesday, they didn't decrease. They actually increased by five bucks. We went 15 to 20. From 20 to 30, um, we also increased. From 30 to 40, we increased again, but from 40 to 35, we decreased. So this was the only spot where we decreased, um, and that is going to be on Friday. That's the night that Danny's tips decreased from the previous night, which was Thursday. So that's our answer here. On what night did Frank earn more in tips than Danny? Well, let's look at this in terms of nights. So on Monday night, Danny earned 15 while Frank earned 20. So that's Monday night is a contender here. Um, on Tuesday, Danny earned 20 where Frank earned 15. So no, he didn't earn more. He didn't earn more on Wednesday either. He earned 25 while Danny earned 30. On Thursday, he earned less than Danny, but on Friday he earned more than Danny. So the only two nights where Frank earned more than Danny, that was on Monday and Friday. <coughs> okay. What is the average rate of change for Frank from Monday to Friday? Well, we want to correspond, um, you know, we want to assign each of these days a number, starting with zero. So Monday can be zero, Tuesday one, Wednesday two, Thursday three, and Friday four. And we can create ordered pairs like this. So basically what we're asking is the slope. When they say rate of change, remember we're looking for the slope between two points. 
the first point is represented by Monday, and the second point is represented by Friday. So, as we said, you know, each of these days are going to correspond to a number. So, Monday, the, um, the first number in our ordered pair is zero, and the, the amount that Frank made on Monday was 20, 20 bucks. So this is going to be 0, 20. On Friday, which is day 4, he made 50 bucks. So that's our output value for Friday. And so the rate of change is the slope between these two points. I can call this one x1, y1, and this one x2, y2. And so I have y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1. And when I get that, I get $7.50, because that's my y unit, per night. That's my x unit. So this right here is my average rate of change. Which of the following statements is true about this graph? It says Max's music machine's annual profits increase annually. Well, if we start at year 2013, it looks like it is increasing to 2014. From 2014 to 2015, it is increasing, but from 2015 to 2016, it's actually decreasing. So this little part right here is going to give us a contradiction. So A is not the correct choice here. Um, let's look at choice B. The greatest increase in profits was between 2016 and 2017. And one way you can look at this is in terms of the steepness of the slope. The steeper the slope, the greater the increase. So um, the greatest increase in profits was between 2016 and 2017. We can see that between these guys, this is going to have the steepest slope, right? Because, I mean, you can imagine somebody walking up a mountain like this. This guy is going to be steeper than, say, this guy. So that's definitely steeper, right? Or even, say, this guy. Um, increase, this isn't even a contender because we're decreasing the profits. Or this guy right here. So the yellow, blue, and green are all flatter than this red part. And so the steepest part is going to be um, between 2016 and 2017. So this has to be our correct answer choice. Now let's look at the other choices here. It says Max earned $0 in 2013. Well, no, because here's 2013. If we look at the height, well, we can see that the height's about at $35,000. So he earned $35,000 then. There were, and the next one says there were two yearly increases of 5,000 between 2013 and 2019. So let's prove that one's false. Well, let's see. From 2013 to 2014, what's the increase? Well, we went from 35,000 to, oh, actually, I meant to put 2014. Let's change that. So I went from 35,000 to 45,000. So that's an increase of 10,000. Okay, what about from 2014 to 2015? Let's see what happens there. So I go from 45 to 50. So that is a $5,000 increase, 45,000 to 50,000. So that's going to count. So that's one. What about 2015 to 2016? So that's a decrease, so that's not even a contender. 
What about 2016 to 2017? So 2016, we're at 40,000. 2017, we're at 55,000. So that is not going to be a $5,000 increase either. From 2017 to 2018, we go from 55 to, it looks like 60. Okay, so this is a... 55 to 60 is indeed a $5,000 increase. And finally, from 2018 to 2019, we go to six, go from 60 to 65. So again, that's another $5,000 increase. So actually, we don't have two yearly increases of 5,000. We have three. So D is not the correct choice either. Our answer here is going to be choice B. All right. So that was the first section in our little um, data slash statistics unit. Next thing we're going to talk about is um, looking at charts and uh, tables and data sets and finding information about mean, median, mode, and range. Then we're going to talk about the shape of data distributions. Um, you know, for the T's test, you don't have to really get in the weeds with the statistics stuff. You just have to know the very, very basics. Okay, so the first definition we have is the mean. So basically, the mean is just the average of a set of numbers. So to find the mean, we just add all of the numbers in our list up and then divide by the amount of numbers in our list. So for example, if we want to find the mean of this data set, we just add all these guys up. 3 plus 3 plus 3 plus 7 plus 8 plus 9 plus 9 plus 14. And then we want to divide by the the number of uh, numbers in our data set. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So when we do that, we get a mean of 7. So our median is going to be the middle number of an ordered list. We want to make sure the numbers are in order first before looking for the median. If we have an odd number, um, if we have an odd number of data points, it's pretty easy. We just look for the middle number. But if we have an even number of data points, we take the average of the two middle numbers. So let's look at an example here. We want to find the, the median of this set. So I'm going to put these in order. So the lowest is 3. So we have three threes. And then the next lowest is 7, then 8, then 9, then 9, then 14. So now I have an odd number of points. I have 8 of them. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So I want to look for the two middle numbers. So that's going to be these guys, right? Because there's three numbers on each side. So now I just take the average of these two. So 7 plus 8 divided by 2 is going to give us 7.5. So that is our median in this example. Now the mode is just the number that occurs the most often. So in this list, the only number that occurs more than, well, actually, 3 occurs 3 times and 9 occurs twice. So 3 is going to be the mode here because it occurs the most. The range is found by subtracting the um, highest value minus the lowest value in your data set. So in this example, our highest value is 14 and our lowest value is 3. So the range is just 14 minus 3, which is 11. So that's our range. All right, let's do another example. I encourage you to pause the video here to see if you can uh, get this one. So the mean, um, I want to add all of these up. And then we want to divide by 
1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And that's going to give us 5. So that's our mean. For our median, let's go ahead and put these things in order first. So I have 0 as my lowest number, followed by 1, 2, and I have two twos, three, um, five, six, seven, eight, and sixteen. So I have an even number of data points, so I look for my two middle numbers. So I think that's going to be these two, because I have four on this side, four on this side, so those are my middles. And then I add the two up and divide by two to take their average. So this is going to give me a median of four. All right, let's find the mode. So the mode is the number that occurs the most in our set. And as we can see, that number is two. The range is going to be the highest data point, which is 16 minus the lowest data point, which is 0. So our range here is 16. OK, let's talk about some different shapes of graphs that we have, or data distribution. Now again, as I mentioned, you don't have to go too in depth with this stuff. Um, really, you just need to know some general principles here. Um, the first principle that I'm going to talk about is normal distribution. So what that means basically is most of the data, like if you have a big list of numbers, most of it is going to be uh, concentrated around the mean of your data. Um, the way that it looks is bell-shaped. You can see that, you know, the data is represented by these bars and it sort of traces out a bell shape if you were to um, draw a graph that kind of fit that data. Symmetric, um, you know, that means that if we were to just look at the graph, the bell shaped graph, it's symmetric because the middle of this guy, well it's symmetric about the middle because um, we have mirror images of each other on the left side of that line and on the right side. So these are the base it's basically the same exact shape and size on both sides. That's what symmetric means. And it doesn't necessarily have to be symmetric about the middle. You know, you could have a you could have some data distribution like let's say we're at I don't know. Um let's say we're at the point 3 and maybe we have some data here 1 2 3 4 5 one, two, three, four, five. So this, you know, three would be kind of like our axis of symmetry here, if you want to think of it like that, uh, because we have the same size data set on each side of three. So that's what symmetric means. Um, unimodal ha means that we have one peak. Um, so just one highest point, that's what the peak is. So that's the idea of normal distribution, just you know, again, you don't have to really get into this. When you take intro to stats, you're going to talk a lot about normal distribution. But uh, for this test in particular, you just need to know what the shape of the graph looks like, the idea of symmetry, and the f and what uh, unimodal and bimodal mean. So bimodal means that we have two peaks in our data. So, um, and you can see them here, that's just like highest point, right? Bi means two. Bimodal means that we have uh, two highest points, two peaks. Skewed right. Okay, so this is a little counterintuitive. I know it was for me when I first learned it. But basically, skewed right means the opposite of what you think it would mean, maybe. Um, basically, fewer observations to the right means that we're skewed right. Do you see how to the right here we have fewer observations than to the left. So the fewer the fewer observation observations to the right means that this thing is skewed right. So it looks like it's like intuitively you might think oh well it's skewed left because there's a bunch of stuff to the left but no no no. 
it's skewed right. So make sure you make a note of that. Um, this is a very popular, very popular question that they ask on the T is the skewed right, skew left. So make sure you're, um, you're good with this. Now skewed left, again, it's opposite of what you think. Skewed left means further observations are to the left. So we can see all the observations are concentrated to the right side or the higher values. Um, so this is going to be a skewed left graph. Let's see if we have anything else that I want to talk about down here. No. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this in the next few slides. So just kind of uh, put this in your notes. Um, this is what we call positive correlation. So if the data is trending upward, so um, basically we can think of that as a positive slope of a line that goes through the data. And positive slope means that you have this line and if you put someone on it, they're walking up the mountain. That's what that means, okay? You can see it in this picture here. If you were to put somebody on that line that went through the data, they would be walking up the mountain. So what does this mean in practice? Well, um, typically we like to think of time as our uh, X value. And so what this is saying is, you know, um, we can think of it as, you know, when time, as time goes on, then something increases. Okay. So that's, you know, that's how I like to think about it. Um, you know, we could draw it on a graph like this, where time, where time is here, and let's say age is on the y-axis. And so, when we march up this mountain, that's when time increases, right? This is time equals one, this is time equals two, this is time equals five, you know, et cetera, et cetera. As time, as time increases, age increases, the height increases. That's what positive correlation means. As the x value increases, so does the y value. That's what that means. Now, negative correlation means the exact opposite. Negative correlation says, hey, as time um, increases, then the, the, the height decreases, okay? So we can think of this as negative slope so let's put this here, negative slope. And so negative slope we can think of as a line that slopes downward. So if we put a person on it, they would be walking down a mountain. That's how I like to think about it, kind of simply like that. So it's the exact opposite of what we had for positive correlation. So here's our, here's our axis right here, and let's say that our line goes like this, maybe it's blue, and maybe we have some variable age, and then we have time. So this is saying, hey, as time passes, at time equals zero, at time equals one, at time equals two, at time equals 10, as time passes, the height decreases. Isn't the person at a, at a lower height as time gets bigger and bigger and bigger? right? So that's what that means. That's negative correlation, negative slope. No correlation is, we don't have a strong relationship between the variables. Um, <laughs> so I don't, I don't know where I saw this example, but this is kind of funny. There's no relationship between the amount of tea drunk and level of intelligence. Um, yeah, so when you take statistics, or if you've already taken statistics, you're going to talk about correlation versus causation. Because sometimes there's a correlation, but, you know, you can't really conclude anything from it. Just because two variables correlate doesn't mean that there's a cause. Um, and there's some funny memes about that. You should look up memes, correlation versus causation. Anyway... So there's no relationship between those variables. And the graph kind of looks like this. The line of best fit that goes through the data actually has a slope of zero because if you put a person on it, it's flat ground. 
um, but there's no strong relationship between the variables here. Um, now let's talk about some other types of variation and we're gonna do some practice with this in a few slides but um, basically direct variation is if something goes up so we have two variables right if one variable goes up the other one goes up okay or if one variable goes down the other one goes down okay so like um, uh, well let's see what could we what could we think of well we had examples right here so this was an example of direct variation as time goes up as time passes a person's age goes up right that's direct variation on the other hand um, this is not direct variation this is inverse variation because as one variable goes up time a person's age or sorry a person's height goes down so that's an inverse relationship one thing goes up the other thing goes down um, direct we can have two things go down so let me let me think um, um, let's see maybe we could compare um, a person's height to shoe size so typically the shorter a person the smaller the shoe size that would also be an example of direct variation because they're both going down. Both variables uh, go down simultaneously. So that is um, direct variation and inverse variation. You can think of a lot of different examples in your life. Think of two, two things, two variables. Um, you know, um, let's see. The more you eat, the fatter you'll get usually. Uh, so that's direct variation. Um, what would be an example of inverse variation? Um, well, I think we have some examples on the next slide, but the, these are some good exercises to think about. Um, yeah, so direct and indirect. Let's do a few more examples with graph shapes. So this is a very classic T's question, which of the following best describes the distribution? Well, you know, if we were to fit a graph to this, it would look very close to bell shape. So I'm thinking that that's going to be our answer there. Skewed left, skewed right. Well, there's not um, there's not a bunch of data con like there's not a bunch of data points concentrated to the left or to the right of this curve. It's pretty uniform. And also it's not bimodal because it only has one peak. Let's go on to this question right here. Which of the following describes the trend of the data? So as, so as our independent variable increases, so does our dependent variable or our height in general, not, not in every case, but the data is very close to this line of best fit. And so for that reason, I'm going to say that this guy is increasing because as X increases, so does Y in general in the, bit, in the grand scheme of things. No trend. Okay, so that's not going to be it because, you know, these data points are, are clustered pretty close to the line. If they were a lot farther away, I would say no trend, but, um, you know, since they're pretty close, I would say that this is going to be an increasing, uh, an increasing set of data. Okay, let's look at this one. Which of the following statements best describes a distribution that is skewed left? So remember what skewed left looked like. We had this graph and we had you know, fewer of the data points were to the left. Maybe we had something like this, but then there was a big cluster. There was a big cluster of data points to the right. I know this picture is not the best, but, but that's what this looked like. Okay. And, you know, this is going to be the lowest, the lowest values, the farther left we go. And then the highest values occur the farther right we go so based on my beautiful picture <laughs> um 
and this idea of which of the choices is correct. Well, the data peaks closer to the lower values. Well, that's not going to be true, right? Because the data is peaking towards the higher values, right? So that's going to be our choice B right here. Okay, next section is explain the relationship between two variables. So we're going to talk about dependent and independent. We're also going to talk more about the correlations, positive, negative, and direct and inverse variations. Okay, so, so again, I, I kind of... Um, I gave a little uh, precursor to this a few slides ago, but we're going to look at the relationship between two variables. So how does one changing one variable affect the other? So here's some examples. The more you study, the more knowledge you have. Okay, so um, this would be an example of, of direct variation because as you study more, you have more knowledge, okay? Um, let's look at the second one. The more you study, the less free time you have. So is this direct or inverse? Well, that's going to be inverse because as one value goes up, the time that you study, another value goes down, less free time. Number three, when you exercise, the amount of calories you burn increases. So... In other words, the more you exercise, the more calories you burn. So this is direct, more and more. More and more is direct, less and less is direct, more and less is inverse or vice versa, less and more. When you buy a new video game, the money that you have decreases. So when you buy a new video game, the amount of money that you have decreases. So as you as you collect more video games, your money goes down. So that's an inverse relationship. More video games you have, the less money you have. <laughs> Maybe. Usually. Okay, let's see. All right, so independent and dependent variables. Um, one easy way to think about independent variables are as the cause, and dependent variables are the effect. So one example that I like to use with my algebra students is, is tips, you know. So you're at a restaurant and you're trying to figure out how much tip to leave the waiter or the waitress. Well, that depends on the cost of your meal. If the cost of your meal is $5, you're not going to leave a big tip. But if you have a large party of people and your bill is like $400, the tip is going to be a lot larger than if you were to leave a tip on 5 bucks. So the tip that you leave depends on the cost of your meal. So the cost of your meal in this case, and actually maybe I'll do this in blue to, to stay consistent, is the independent variable. And what depends on the cost of the meal? The tip. So the tip is going to be the dependent variable. So that is one way you can think about that. Let's look at this next example. The health of a plant depends on how much sunlight it gets. So the thing that you can control, the cause, is how much sunlight the plant gets. So this would be the independent variable, how much sunlight we're giving a plant. And the health of the plant depends on how much sunlight it gets. So the health of the plant is going to be our dependent variable. Okay. And number three, the time it takes to melt ice cream depends on the temperature outside. So in this case, and actually this is a good example because we usually think about time as our independent variable, but in this instance, in this, in this specific example, it's actually our dependent variable because the time actually depends on the temperature, the time it takes for the, for the ice cream to melt. So in this case, the temperature outside is our independent variable. And <clears throat> the time that it takes to melt is our dependent variable. So one thing depends on the other.
All right, let's look at some examples here. So the table represents the side of a square compared to its area. So we have side compared to its area. Um, the area of a square is length times width or side times side. So this makes sense, right? If we have a square of one inch, um, then the area is one times one, which is one. So that checks out two inches, two times two is four, that checks out and so forth. So that's the relationship between a square's side and its area. And it says uh, these guys are directly related. Why? Because as the side length goes up, the area also goes up with it. And it shows a positive correlation because we're moving up as as my independent variable gets larger, so does my dependent variable, so it's a positive correlation there. And it says, based on this relationship, which of the following statements is true? So let's analyze these. So the first one, if these two variables were graphed, the slope of the line between any two points would be negative. Well, that's definitely not true because we have a positive correlation. Positive correlation means positive slope. So that's going to be false. Choice B, if these two variables were graphed, the side of the square would be the dependent variable. Well, does the side depend on the area or the other way around? I would think that the area depends on the side length. So that's not it either. The points on the graph should be connected with a straight line to show that they represent variables. Um... I don't think that this is going to be linear when we graph it, so this is also probably not a contender. Let's look at choice D. If two variables were graphed, the slope of the line between any two points would be positive. That's true. If we were to graph these values out, so remember the independent variable goes on the horizontal axis, so we would have one, two, three, four, and then the dependent variable goes on the y-axis. We have one, four, nine, sixteen, something like that. So then we have one, one, two, four, three, nine, uh, four, sixteen, something like this maybe. And yeah, the, the slope between any two points is going to be positive because again, this guy is going up the mountain for any two points on this curve. So our choice D is correct. All right, determine whether each statement is true or false. So A, the more I practice the piano, the better my performance at the recital is. This is positive covariance. Um, that's going to be true because, again, as one thing goes up, the more I practice, the better my performance will be. So I'm going up, up. This is positive covariance. So this is true. Both things are going up. No pain, no gain is an example of direct variation, positive covariance. Definitely direct variation because, again, no pain, no gain, down, down, right? Now, it, this is a little bit tricky because we want to think of the logical equivalence to this, no pain, no gain. And the equivalence is the more pain, the more, <laughs> the more pain, the more gain. So this is equivalent to more pain, more gain. Those two things mean the same thing. And we're going up and up and so this is going to be positive covariance. So this is this is also true and it's direct direct variation because we're going up and up. All right. The more I cough, the less likely I can run at a fast pace is an example of direct variation negative covariance. Okay. So the more I cough, we're going up, the less likely we're going down, okay? Up and down means that we have an inverse variation, not a direct variation. So inverse variation. So this is already false because of that. 
Now, is it a negative covariance? Well, yeah, it is, because if we were to plot this, if we were to plot this, we would have a negative slope, right? So um, maybe, so the x-axis is going to be how much you cough, and then the y-axis is likely to run at a fast pace. We can see that when we start here, likely to run at a fast pace, um, the more you cough, so the more you go horizontally, the less likely you are to run at a fast pace. So this is definitely an example of negative covariance. We got a negative slope going on there. Okay, which of the following represents a negative correlation? Um, so let's see. First one, the more snow we get, the less likely school is open. So more means up, less likely means down. So th yes, this is a negative correlation. Let's look at the other ones. The less you drive down, the less money you make or you spend on gasoline. So that is not a negative correlation because we have two downs here. Part C, the more snow we get up, the more likely school will be closed. Up, up, that's positive, okay, correlation. So that's not going to be it either. And finally, part D, the more you drive, the more money you spend. Again, up, up, we want up, up down to represent a negative correlation. So choice A is going to be the correct answer there. And let's look at one more. So the table shown represents the average daily temperature in degrees Fahrenheit compared to daily sales for a small ice cream stand. Which of the following statements is true? Well, so it says there is an inverse relationship between temperature and ice cream sales. So as temperature goes up, ice cream sales go down or vice versa. Is that true? Well, no. If we look at the lowest temperature, as temperatures go up, so do ice cream sales. So this is not true. It actually has a direct relationship. Let's look at the next one. There is a negative correlation. Well, that's not true either because, again, you know, as temperatures go up, sales go up too. So that's not true. But part C is true. As temperatures go up, sales go up. That's positive correlation. And then the rate of change for any two points is always negative. That's going to be no. That's if we had a, a negative slope here. But um, we know that we have positive correlation, so that is not going to be true. All right, guys. I hope this video was informative. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.